Okay, I think we can start now. Okay, so welcome everyone um, to really like the first session that um, Overmark is having for A-level H2 math. Um, just want to get a sense, right? How many of you guys here are J2? Maybe you can use the raise hand function so that I can just get a sense of how many of you are J2 and J1. All right, so how many of you are J2? Raise your hands. Let's see. Okay. Okay, so, so far I see there's four people that raise their hands. So four people are J2. Uh, five people, five people are J2 now. So taking your A-levels this year, Hope you guys are excited. Six people. Hello, hello. All the best, right, for your A-levels this year. That is coming very soon. <laughs> yes, JC is one of the most exciting times of your life. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, yes, but if you are here, okay, the reason why I chose, because we could, I could have cho chosen to do, like, any topic, right? But one of the reasons why I chose um, functions, because... Um, first of all, it doesn't take as much time as, as you all know vectors, of course. Um, and it's a topic that is relatable to both J1s and J2s. Sorry, I'm still, so you'll see me a bit distracted because I'm still entering people into the, <laughs> into the video, uh, into this Zoom call. Um, yeah, but very excited to be here today to sort of run everyone through, give an introduction overview um, to functions right, um, our topical division. So, but before we begin, um, just want to introduce Overmark to those of you who are maybe a bit new to the organization. Um, so, who are we? We are actually a team of tutors, um, a team of 11 tutors who strive to build a student-centric uh, platform that will empower students with not just academic knowledge, but personal development as well, right? So, we're going to have a and a session at the end, um, if you have any questions regarding, you know, like math or be it not math, like you want to ask about, hey, which uni course should I take? Um, you know, um, yeah, feel free to ask anything, really anything. Um, yeah, and having, you know, been through the, the ring of the education system itself, we understand your struggles, we are here for you, and we are here to, you know, lend you a helping hand. Okay, so my name is Charlene. Um, yeah, you can just call me Charlene. Don't need to like Miss K or anything. Um, I, I, I teach um, A-level H2 math, also H1 math, um, but you know, in general, H2 math. Um, I was from NUS. I studied engineering in NUS. Um, so if any one of you wants to know what that is like, uh, feel free to ask me after as well. Um, I have about four plus years teaching of experience teaching JC math. Um, and I'm currently tutoring both, you know, private as well as group tuition. Yeah. Okay. So today we are going to look at functions. Okay. And then I'm going to take you guys through one pretty long practice question, just because I don't think we will have time. Um, don't worry, right? So this PowerPoint deck that I am going through, um, after I make, you know, all the notations, because as you can see, I can write on this. Um, then I will upload it onto the Overmark Telegram chat so you guys can take your own notes, um, like do take your own notes, right? Um, but you can download this after the session as well. Yes. Okay, so with that, let's begin. Let's take a look at functions. Okay. Um, so functions, okay, is actually a subset of relations, okay? So what do I mean by that? So let's take a look at what a relation is and what a function is first, okay? So a relation is a rule that maps elements, okay, of a given set, A. So typically, I'm sure you guys know in functions, okay, sorry, let me admit the people first. Okay. In functions, uh, you always see these two ovals, right? Okay, and then you have like X. Y. And then you always see like arrows going from X to Y. 
right? And then it can look very funny like that as well, okay? So um, what we mean is, right, a relation is a rule that maps elements of a given set A, so the input to elements of a given set B. So this is your input, right? The one on the left is always your input. And then set B, which is, or set Y will be your output, okay? And then the input is known as the domain, and the output is known as the co-domain. Okay, so I'm going to take a look at one scenario, right? Just so that we can all understand, okay? I think the best way to learn is to understand in context, okay? So we look at what a relation is first, okay? So let's say I have um, students, okay? I have, let's see who is here. I have Eva. Eva, okay, and I have, just now I saw Wei Xiong. I have a friend named Wei Xiong, so I'm going to put your, your name here. <laughs> okay, so I have, we have two students in a class, okay, and these students, they take a certain subject combination, okay, so they take some subjects, like everyone needs to take what, GP, right, um, and then some people take like physics, okay, and then, of course, we have math. Uh -huh. um, some people are more artsy. Maybe they take job. Right? And then maybe we have another one, Ken. Okay? So let's, so both Eva and Wei Xiong take GP. Okay? But let's say Eva takes um, math and Ken. Yeah. And then Wei Xiong takes physics and job. Okay, so as you can see, in this case above, right, the domain, or rather the input will be what? The input will be Eva, so the domain will be Eva, right, Wei Xiong, okay, and then the co-domain, so the co-domain is everything inside this oval, right, all the Y values here, so this will be the list of co domain that we have, okay? And as you can see, this is a one. So one input in the students has many relations to the output. So this itself is a one-to-many relation, okay? So this is a bit on relations, right? This entire, re this entire relationship, right? Literally relationship is called a relation, okay? Co-domain, very good question. Okay, so someone asked me, is co-domain equal to range? No, co-domain is not equal to range. Okay, and we will see later on what is the difference between them. Okay, so yes, feel free, right, to type questions into the chat. I will try and like look at the questions, admit the participants, and go through the content at the same time. A bit challenging, but we will try. Okay, we will try together. Um, yeah, okay, so... This is a basically what a relation is. Let's look at the definition of a function, okay? So a function is a relation, okay, which maps each and every element, okay, in the input to one and only one element in the co-domain, okay? So the key is one and only one, okay? So every input has only one output, okay? So... Let's take a look at what this means. And I will answer the question about is co-domain equal to range? Okay. So now I'm going to look at, so this was relation, right? Okay. This is a relation. Okay. Now I'm going to look at functions. Okay. So let's say we have this function. Okay. We have the function fx is equal to our x squared. Very simple one, okay? And then we write the domain, okay? So where x is our x is real, okay? And then x equals to 3 and 5, okay? So what will this look like? Let me admit people, okay? This will look like this, okay? So we have the x values over here. Our domain is what? 3 and 5. 
right? See from over here, three and five. Okay, and let's say we have y, right? Uh, we have the co-domain of 2, 9, 14, 25. So giving some numbers here, right? So as you can see for this function, okay, x squared, if I put x equals to 3, right, over here, it will be 3 squared. So this will be related to what? 9, right? And then let's take a look at 5. If I put 5 inside here, it will be 5 squared and it will be related to 25. Okay, so this is a function because one input corresponds to one output, right? One input corresponds to one output. One input corresponds to one output. So yes, it is a function, okay? In this case, the domain is what? Very easy, right? Three and five, right? So this is the domain. Okay. The co-domain will be all the values in Y. So this includes two, nine, 14, and 25. The range will be only the output from the domain. So in this case, the range is only 9 and 25. Okay, so you see the difference between co-domain and range, right? Range is only after you map elements from x to y, then whatever these y values are that were mapped out, this is the range. Okay? So we're going to move on now. Representing functions. Okay. So as I'm sure we all know, there are two options that you have when you want to represent functions. The first one is you do this f dot dot x. You draw this line, arrow, and then you write the rule of the function, comma, the domain, okay? So take note that for A levels, okay, you have to state clearly both the rule and domain. You don't need to state the range when you are writing a function, but every time you write a function, right, be it in the question or be it in the answer, final answer itself, please try and write the, or rather, please write both the rule and domain. Okay, so no need to write range at A levels. Okay, another option you have is you write this. So fx, right, is equal to, and then again, rule. So this is the rule, and this is the Domain. Rule. Domain. Okay. Usually we represent is rule equals to relation. No. Okay. So like I said, right? Relation, right? When we when we say something is a relation, right? Is this entire relationship over here? Okay. The rule, right, is this itself. This is what we call the rule. It is like, what is, it is basically the graph equation. Yeah, the graphical equation. Okay, sorry, let me admit people. Okay. Okay. So let's take a look, right, um, at an example. Okay. Okay. So let me just, Take out my worksheet so I can refer. Sorry, my there is a mess. Um, okay, let's take a look at an example. So let's say we have. I'm gonna use the fx um equals to. Oh, sorry, I'm gonna use the same example. Right. Let's say we have fx equals to x squared. Okay, x is real, right? But this time, 
the range of x is from 0 to uh, 3. Okay, so when you draw the graph, you look something like that, right? Okay, it passes through the origin. Okay, but you must take note of the domain, right? You see, it's only from 0 to 3. Okay, so I'm going to say this is less than or equal to 3. This is more than 0, okay? So this, if you draw this in an exam to represent a function, right, this is wrong, okay? What you need to draw is over here, From zero, okay, so zero will be over here and it is not equal to zero, right? So you draw a empty circle because it's not equal to zero, okay? And then only until three and then you draw a fill-in circle because it's less than or equal to three, okay? Then this will be correct. Label your axis, right? This is zero. This down here will be three. This down here will be nine. Then you can write fx is equal to x squared over here. Then this will be correct, okay? And then let's take a look at this function, right? Okay, over here, okay? The domain, of course, is 0 to 3, right? Okay, or we can write it this way. Let's write it this way instead. From 0, not including 0, to 3, including, okay? And then the range will be what? From 0 to 9. Okay, so when it comes to brackets, your square brackets means that it includes the number. It does not include the number. Okay, and then your curve brackets means that it is including. Okay. Okay, we're going to move on now. How do we prove that a function exists? Okay, we're going to use the vertical line test. Okay, so let's take a look at an example. Another example, let's say we have fx is equal to root of 2x. Okay. And then x is real. What will the graph look like? The graph will look like that. Okay. So this one you can use your GC to help you plot. Okay, um, and how we do the vertical line test is, okay, number one, go and draw the sketch of the graph, okay, and remember to take note of the domain when you are sketching, okay, and show any asymptotes, right, this is all in chapter two on graphing techniques, right, everything that you need to sort of note in a graph sketch, okay, then on the same diagram, you're going to draw a vertical line. Okay, because it's called the vertical line test, right? And you're going to see that this is x equals to k, a constant k. Okay, can you see that this x equals to k cuts this graph at more than one point? Okay, it cuts at where? Here, one, two. Right? Okay, and then if, so if the graph cuts at, if the vertical line cuts the graph at more than one point, it is not a function. So this is not a function. Okay, and you will write it, right, in the exam. So you will say, since, right, vertical line, 
x equals to k, where k is real, right? Okay. There's not cut the graph of f at one and only one point, okay, f is not. A function. Okay. Can let me know if I'm going too fast or too slow. So, yeah. Okay. So obviously, if it is a function, right? So let's say this, right? We change, right? Okay. Let's say this was only the positive. Okay, so let's say we're looking at fx is equal to positive root of 2x. And then the graph will look like that, right? Okay. The graph will look like that. And when you draw a vertical line down, it cuts at only one point. Then what you would say is, since the vertical line cuts, okay, the vertical line x equals to k, so the, the format is the same. It's just that you will say since it cuts the graph at one and only one point, it is a function. So the format like this answer, right, is always the same. Yeah, so this is a function. Okay. Okay. Admit. Okay, now let's move on to talk about inverse functions. Okay, so inverse functions, right? So functions is, we have like f, our most standard function is f. Inverse functions is f inverse. Okay, so it is such that if y equals to fx, okay, then x will be equal to f inverse y. Okay, so let's take a look, right, okay, at what this means. Let's say I have A function that goes a b c d e f and it goes like that okay so this is my function f okay all the inverse function does is reverse it basically okay so this time the input right okay becomes d e f and the output becomes A, B, and C. This is the inverse function. Okay. And as you can see, right, okay, clearly, so this is the inverse function. For inverse functions, the domain become the range and the range become the domain. So it's tombale. Okay. So you're going to write it over here. Domain of f inverse becomes the range of f. Okay, and the domain of f is the range of f inverse. Okay. Okay. So how do we prove that an inverse function exists? We use the horizontal line test. So 
please don't mix up. Uh. Okay. For proving that a function exists, we use the vertical line test. To prove that an inverse exists, we use the horizontal line test. Why? Because at A levels, to determine if a function has an inverse or the inverse exists, we just need to prove that this function is one-to-one. -one. Okay? So let's take a look at an example so that we can go through together. Okay? Again, we are going to use our our x square example. So we're gonna understand it from a very simple point of view first, okay? Okay, so this is our x square, right? Is this an, is this an inverse function? Okay, let's take a look. If we draw the horizontal line, okay? This time, we'll label it y equals to k, okay? Does it cut at more than one point? Yes, right? One, two, okay? So if it cuts at more than one point, its inverse does not exist, okay? So what I'm going to write is since the horizontal line y goes to k, where k is real, cuts the graph at more than one point, okay, it is not a one, to one function. It is not a one-to-one -one function. Hence, its inverse does not exist. So this is not, there's no inverse function for this function. We are gonna look at a counter example now, okay? Let's say again, we look at this graph instead, right? Okay, so we're gonna look at, or rather let's look at the negative one, lah, okay? So this is um, fx equals to x squared, but your x has to be, less than zero, okay? So as you can see, when you draw a horizontal line, it cuts at only one point, right? Okay, so yes, inverse, or rather, okay, yes, cuts at one and only one point. Okay. Yes, it is a one-to-one -one function. And yes, the inverse exists. Okay? Okay, so we now know how to prove that an inverse function exists, but how do we find, how do we determine the inverse function? Okay, so we are going to look at another example. Okay, the example that we're going to look at is this. Okay, so we have the function. This time, let's use Okay, this is the function that we're going to look at. Okay. 
Okay. So first step, okay, you're going to say, right, when you want to change this, okay, let's say you already proved that the inverse exists, okay, and the inverse does exist, okay, for this function. So let's say you already proved that the inverse exists, then how do we find what the inverse function is? Okay, so what you're going to do is, you're going to let y be equal to fx. Okay, so which is equal to ln 8 minus x. So y is equal to this, then you're going to manipulate it and you're going to make x the subject. Okay, so let's do this together. From here, right, y equals to ln 8 minus x cubed. Okay. You're going to bring the e from over here. There's a small imaginary e here. You're going to bring it over here. So 8 minus x cubed will be e to the power of y. All right. Then you're going to cube root both sides. Okay, so you get 8 minus x is e to the power of y over 3. Then you're going to manipulate so that you get x is equal to 8 minus e to the power of y over 3. So if you've successfully made x the subject, now you need to state. So therefore, f inverse x is equal to 8 minus e x over 3. A lot of people, common mistake, a lot of people forget to change back, right, to x. But please remember to do so. And please remember in your final statement, okay, to go and write the new domain. So this domain will actually be the range of f inverse. Okay, so the range of f inverse the range of this, right, is actually that you can take any real values. Okay, so this new domain. Is equal to the range of f inverse. Okay, if the question asks, and a lot of questions ask this, right, for you to express the function in a similar form. It means that, okay, going back up over here. It means that if they express the function as this, in this form, right, in the question, you are going to express it in this form as well. Okay, if they express it in this form, you are going to express it in this form. And I just realized, sorry, that I made a mistake. This, from Bali, too blue. This means include. And this means there's not include. Yes, so we're going to correct that. Okay. So this should be different as well. Where we write this means there's not include. And this means there's not include. Sorry, I know it looks a bit curved. Ah, oh. uh, and some of you actually pointed it out. So sorry, I think I missed it out. Yeah. Okay. Any questions so far? If you have questions, feel free to put them in the chat. I will actively look at the chat from now on. <laughs> but yes, okay. So, so far, I hope everyone is clear. Right, okay. So, what we've covered so far, we have looked at what functions are, what relations are, right? How we represent functions. Okay, we've looked at how to prove a function that exists, vertical line test. Okay. And it's always very standard. You just need to go and copy and paste this statement, right? And iterate according to the question. 
Okay, the statements are always very standard. Okay, inverse function, understand what it is. Basically, it means that you tombale, right? You invert it, okay? Literally inverse, right? An inverse function. We have learned how to prove an inverse function exists using the horizontal line test, okay? And we have learned how to determine the inverse function. Now I'm going to look at the graphical relationship between a function and its inverse, okay? So if you have a function, right, for instance, we have gx is equal to 1 plus e to the power of minus x. The inverse, okay, will be this, right? If you go and work it out like how we did over here, I think it's good practice for you to practice um, inverting this as well at home. Yeah, okay. Then you will see if you plot them both on your GC, for determining the inverse function, it's only non functions covered. Um, no, you have to learn how to, okay, you have to know how to inverse like normal functions as well. Okay, so let's say we have, let me give an example, yeah. So if you are not looking at non functions, okay. If you are looking at, let's say we have um, the graph GX, is equal to, I don't know, right? Very simple one, right? Um, 3x plus 1. This is definitely a function. Yeah. Okay. Then what you're going to do is you're going to let y be equal to 3x plus 1 and make x the subject formula. So how you do this? 3x is y minus 1. x will be y minus 1 over 3. Okay, so your inverse function will be x over 3 minus 1 third. And then you give whatever domain that is. Yeah, does that answer your question? Sorry. Okay, glad I answered your question. Okay. Yeah, so as you can see, what's the relationship between a function and its inverse? Okay, you can plot it in your GC, you'll see. They are reflected images of each other in the line y equals to x. And this is commonly tested. Like they will ask you, what's the relationship between a function and its inverse? So just remember this, that they are reflected images of each other in the line y equals to x. Okay? Which basically just means exactly what it means. Like, if you reflect it about this line, you will get the inverse function. Okay. So important to also note, right? Um, sometimes they will ask you to sketch as well. Um, important to note that that means that any point of intersection, right, between the two functions, the function and its inverse, will lie on this y equals to x line as well. Okay. And I think good to note when you're sketching um, the graphs of the function and its inverse on the same axis like that, the scales ideally for the x and y axis must be the same. Okay. Okay, so that's all that I want to cover for inverse functions. Okay, let's move on now to composite function. Okay. Composite functions like GF. Okay, what does this mean? What is GFX? Okay, we can see this as GFX. So initially, there used to be an X over here, right? Okay. This used to be x. Now we're replacing this x with fx, okay? We are replacing this x with fx. May I check if the inverse function should have been... 
The inverse function is that. Uh, minus ln 1 minus x. Yeah, let me see. Minus ln 1 minus x. I can check for you. Uh, wait now. Nah. Uh, no, it should be, it's correct. It's minus ln 1 minus x. Because you have to bring this minus 1 over. So it will become or rather y actually. Yeah, so no, it's correct. Um, The person that asked the question. The one in the in this example, it's correct. Yeah. Then why is there a negative outside? Oh, sorry. Wait, uh. Let me admit people first and then answer your question. <laughs> this is a very inefficient method of having to look at everything. <laughs> uh, okay, so... Okay, we can do it together actually. Since we have time, I assume that we have time. Okay, sorry. Yeah, I'm having a careless mistake. I was very sleepy when I was doing this. Okay, so we look at gx, right? Okay, we're going to look at how to inverse this function. Okay. So again, what you're going to do is you're going to let y be equal to this. Okay. And then you're going to make x the subject. So e to the power of negative x will be y minus 1. You learn both sides, you get negative x. Y minus 1. And then you get x equal to... Ah, uh, yes. Okay, sorry. So, yes, this will be x minus 1 instead. The other way around. Okay, so don't forget to invert it back. So, your g inverse x will be negative ln x minus 1. And then you write whatever the domain is. Yeah. So it looks like it can't take the zero value. So it looks like x will be more than zero. Yeah. But thank you for pointing it out. Yeah. Feel free to point out if I made any careless mistakes. OK. So. Um, composite functions, we have gfx, okay? So as I said, we can look at it as from this point of view, right? We have g, and then we have like bracket, large square brackets, and then fx inside. So you sort of replace your x with fx, okay? Um, something to note, right, okay, is that gf does not equals to fg. Like you cannot just switch it around like that. This is wrong. Okay, or rather, sorry, this statement is correct. But yeah, you cannot just switch it around like that. Okay, it's not commutative. All right. So if a function, okay, so what this actually means, right? Okay, this gfx, it actually means that, okay, I have, we always start with the inner one first. So I have f, okay. So after I map from f, from x to y, right, with f, okay, the function f, I map what? From there, right, I met with G to Z. Okay, so GF is just a more direct way of going there. Okay, so GF denotes um, that we apply the mapping. Okay, we apply the mapping of the inner function F. Okay, followed by the mapping of the outer function G. So this is for GF. Okay, we are mapping two times. One, two. Okay. So, a, a, com, a composite function, okay, exists only when the range of the inner function, so the range of, for GF, for the case of GF, the range of 
F, wait, uh, let me admit, okay, the range of F is a subset. Okay, so this is, is a subset. of the domain of G, okay? That means that what this looks like is this, okay? If this is the domain of G, my range of F should sit inside over here. Or it could be that they are the same, right? So they are both. Right, this is the domain of G. This is also the range of F. So they are equal. Okay, it's either they are equal. Oops, sorry. Equal. If not, the range of F has to be within the domain of G. Oh. Okay. And then, now we're going to look at how we determine the composite function itself. Okay. So, I think a good example will be, okay, let's say we have, May I know the difference between a complete subset and a subset? Okay. So this is actually the difference. If it is a complete subset, right, means that even if it's equal, or rather what we call a proper subset, lah, actually. Okay. A proper subset means that even if it's equal, it's considered as a subset. Okay. But if it's a subset, then it will just be this scenario. Okay. But for our this, um, proper subset, right? It will be both scenarios also okay. Yeah. Does that answer your question? Great, awesome. Okay. So now let's take a look at how to determine the composite function. And from here, right, you will understand like what exactly a composite function is as well. Okay. So we are going to take a look at fx, okay, fx will be equal to x squared minus 1, okay, and we're going to look at gx, let's say 2x plus 1, okay, so, and let's say I want to find uh, gf, okay, we're going to look for the composite function gf, okay, so like I said, gf, Okay, gf, you can see it as g, fx like that. Okay, you are going to sub the inner function into the outer function. What I mean by this is, okay, you are going to sub into here, right, okay, the x, right, you're going to sub the entire function of fx into here, this x. Okay, so this will actually be equal to 2. And then x, right, will be replaced by x squared minus 1 plus 1. Okay? Follow so far. I hope you follow so far. And then you're going to simplify it. Okay, so this is like the simplest form already. And this is actually your composite function. So I think I want to, I want everyone to take note of, okay, is that we have, sometimes you'll see funny, funny functions like FF. Okay, so this actually means it's like F of FX. And we actually write this, okay, as f square x as well. So if you see this, this is what it means. Okay, these are composite functions. 
And in this scenario, you will do exactly the same thing as what we did here. You just sub in to find. Okay. I'm going to move on now. Okay. Oh, before I move on, sorry. Let's talk a bit about the domain. Okay, of composite functions. So the domain. of gf is actually equal to the domain of f, the inner function. So you must remember to go and write your domain of f as well. Okay, so let's say this is just the axis view. Okay. Okay. Another thing I want everyone to take note of. Okay, so we've talked about like how you determine the composite function, the steps involved. We've talked about um this form of composite function, right? It composite functions itself, which is a bit funny, but yeah. Um, and then like the domain of a composite function is the domain of the inner function. Okay, now I want to talk a bit about inverse functions. So what happens when we combine an inverse function and composite function? What I mean by this is, okay, what happens when we take a look at, and there's no space, so I'll write it over here, okay. When we take a look at f, f inverse x. For this special case, this is actually equal to f inverse fx. And this is equal to x. Okay? So this is another special case that you need to take note of. It will just be equal to x. And if you think about it, I guess it does make sense, right? Okay, I like to think about it as like the inverse is eating up the function and then all you're left with is x or the function is eating up the inverse and all you're left with is x, yeah. But what is the difference between f, in, f, f inverse and f inverse f? What is the difference? Oh, what am I saying by eating up? Sorry, that's just the way I think about it because it's like as though this function right, is eating this up, right? And then all you're left with is x. <laughs> yeah, that's how I remember. And then like this inverse is eating up this and then all you're left with is x. Yeah, this is not mathematically correct. This is just the way that I'm thinking about it. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's to help me remember. Yeah. Oh, can I show an example? Okay. Um, wait, maybe before I move on, right, um, to the example, can we, let's, let's take a look, right, and what's the difference between this and this first, okay? So like I said, the domain of f, right, okay, or rather the domain of the composite function will be the domain of the inner function. So that is exactly the difference, okay? So for this, the domain, okay, will be the domain of f inverse, and for this, the domain, will be the domain of f. So that's the difference between these two. Okay? So at the end of f, f inverse, I just have x. Yes, correct. Let's say you prove everything already. You prove that it's an inverse function and it exists, okay? Then if they give you this composite function, yes, it does equal to x at the end. If they give you this, also equals to x. Does it answer your question? Okay. Um, okay, so let's take a look at an example, shall we? Or uh, let's find some space. Okay. Sorry, I didn't realize that the space would be so little, or rather, I didn't realize that my handwriting would be so big. Haha. <laughs> okay, but. <laughs> Let's, let's take a look, sorry, sorry, let's take a look. 
um, at f, f in press example. We can take a look at the same example as just now over here. Okay. So we're going to see, hmm, or rather let's, let's take a look at this example then. No, let's take a look at this example. Let me just copy this, okay? Is it possible for me to do so? Okay, never mind. Let's just take a look at this example here then. Okay, so if we're going to look at G and G inverse, okay, so we have gx is 1 plus e to the power of minus x, g inverse x is equal to negative ln x minus 1, right? Okay. Mm, which example shall we take a look at? Shall we look at G inverse G. Okay. So like I said, you can look at it this way. And we are going to suck in. Okay. So this will be equal to negative ln. And then you're going to suck this entire thing in. Okay. 1 plus e to the power of negative x. Minus 1. Okay, why? It's amazing how people are still entering at this time. <laughs> like truly amazing. Okay, but yes, welcome to all the newcomers. Oh um, yeah, okay. So we can see from over here, right? Okay, one minus one, this will cancel out. Let's cancel it out. Okay, so this will be equal to negative ln e to the power of negative x. Right, and as we all know, ln e is just one, right? So you can bring this down over here. It will be x ln e, because the negatives will cancel each other out, okay? And this will be equal to x. Ding, ding. Ken, is this example enough for you? Like, does it answer your question? I hope it does. I'll move on first, okay? Because in terms of time, I, I do want to go through the practice example. Okay, wait, sorry. During exam, do we have to show all the working or can we just write X? Depends on the question. Yeah. But show the working. Just show the working. If you read the question and you're not sure, just show the working. Yeah. Because, I mean, you never know, right? Like, there might be method marks to be honest. It depends on how much the question is worth as well. Obviously, if you see it's a one-mark question, don't bother to write the working. Yeah. So in exam, be a bit like savvy about this. Okay. Okay, okay. Let's move on. Let's move on. Okay. The last part is like one of the hardest parts, I feel, that a lot of people struggle with, which is looking at the range of composite functions. Okay. So how do we find the range of composite functions? I have four steps. I know a lot of schools teach you like to draw the graph, right? And then you like find a range from there. I don't like to do that. I think that it is like a bit unreliable, a bit of an unreliable method. Okay, so my four steps are, number one, you are going to use the domain. Okay, so, sorry, let me set context. Okay, you are trying to find a range of GF. Okay, number one, we always start with the inner function. Remember, like I said this from the start when we just started with this composite function section. Start with the inner function. Okay, you are going to use the domain of the inner function to find the range of the inner function. So number one, basically, find the range of f using the domain 
of f. Okay? Number two. You are going to set, okay, the range of f to be the new domain of G. So this new range, this range of F, this is this will become the new domain of G. Number three. Okay. With this new domain of G, okay? So after you set, set this as the new domain of G, you are going to find, okay, the new range of G. And then number four, this new range of G is equal to the range of GF. So very clear. This is something that I tell all my students. Just follow this four-step formula, right? It's very difficult for you to go wrong. Okay? Let me just enter some more people. Okay. Um, but let's look at an example. I know that math is very difficult to understand unless we have an example. Okay? Let's take a look, huh? Okay, I think as we go through the practice example, or rather, sorry, no, I think when we go through the practice example, okay, it's easier for you to understand as well what I mean by that. Okay, let me take a look at the chat. Does step two mean that range of F is equal to the domain of G? Okay, I go through again, uh, this part, I know this part is difficult to grasp, and understand, okay? So what you're gonna do is, you find the range of F, right, okay? You set this to be the new domain of G. The range of F may not be equal to the domain of G in the question. What, but you don't care about the existing domain of G because what you're gonna do is, you're gonna set the range of F as the new, right? The keyword is new domain of G. Does that answer your question? Okay, feel free to ask like anything really. Okay, this is like your time to clarify things. Okay. Okay, so let's take a look at this example. Okay, I'm gonna close the chat box now. Okay, because we are gonna take a look at this example together. Okay. The function g is defined by gx equals to ax plus b, okay? Um, where a and b are positive real numbers, okay? Show that, see, so this is what I'm talking about, right? Like the g square, g square x. Show that g square x exists. So in your mind, even though this does not look like a composite function, you should, in your mind, know, hey, this is a composite function. Then think about what is the rules, what is the condition for existence for a composite function, okay? And that's how you sort of like proceed with the question. So show that g squared x exists and hence determine the range of g squared, leaving your answer in terms of a and b. Okay. So like I said, g squared is actually the composite function g squared x, or rather g g x, okay? For this to exist, okay, the range of g has to be a subset of the domain of g, right? This is something that we just went through, yeah? Okay, I'm going to draw the graph 
Okay, this graph, even though there's no numbers, oops, okay. You can still draw it. Okay, because this you can you will notice this is a okay linear graph. Right? It takes the general form of y equals to mx plus c. Okay, so you can draw it even though there's no numbers. Okay. And I want you to take note of the domain. X has to be more than zero. So the graph will look something like this. More than zero, right? That's not include. Oops. Wait, nah. Something like this. Okay. And you're going to write GX. Okay. So from the graph, right? You can see that the range of G is equal to what? What is the range of G? Okay, it cuts over here. Actually, this right at this point, B is the Y intercept. This B. Okay. And you can see that the range of G which is the set of values the graph can, the set of y values the graph can take, right? Let's see. Why don't you include the point that intersects the y axis? That's a very good question. Why do we not include this? Because it says x is more than zero, not more than or equal to zero. It's more than zero. That's why you don't include it at the y axis. Does that answer your question? Okay, so as I was saying, okay, this is the y intercept at B. Okay, so the range of G will be the range of values that the range of y values that this graph can take, which will be from B, right? And it's is it including B? No. So we use the curve. It's from B all the way until infinity, right? Because it'll keep going up. Okay, so every time there's infinity, right, you just use the curved bracket, not including. Okay. And then what is the domain of G? You can actually, okay, the domain of G is actually what? From zero, right? Not including zero. To infinity as well. Okay. Since B, right, you see over here, since B is a, Positive real number, that means what? Since B is more than zero, right? Positive real number. It means that the range of G indeed is a subset of the domain of G and therefore G square exists. Okay, so we have done the first part. We have shown that G squared exists. Now we need to determine the range of G squared. Okay, so like I said, G squared is G, G, X, right? Okay. So this case is a bit special because it's like you are determining the inner function is the same as the outer function. Okay, but we are going to follow through with the steps nonetheless. Okay, so you see over here, find the range of f using the domain of g. So we are going to find the range of the inner function, which is g. We have found the range of the inner function to be b to infinity. Okay, we are going to set this as the new domain of g. What do I mean by this? This time I'm going to say that, hey, now, right? We are going to start the graph from here when x equals to b. Okay, we are going to start the graph from here. So now the graph will only exist in the pink part. Okay, because this is the new domain 
of G. So G will only exist from B to infinity. Okay. So that's the second step done. With this new domain of G, find the new range of G. So now I need to find the new range of this pink color part. Okay. How do I do that? I need to find what is this Y value, right? Okay. When X is equal to B, right? GX is equal to what? A, B plus B. A, B plus B. Okay. So now the new range of G will be from a, B plus B to infinity, right? Because it's from this point and up. And this is equal to the new, or rather it's equal to the range of G square. And we are done. Ken, is everyone clear? I hope, I hope everyone follows. Right, and understands how to find the range of composite function because to be very honest, it always comes out. Be in your prelim, be at A levels. They like to test this question because they know that it is the more difficult part of functions. Yeah. Okay. So I'm gonna move on now to the next part. And don't worry, okay, like I said. I'm going to upload this entire slide deck onto um, Telegram after the session. Okay. Next part. Function h is defined by hx, okay? hx is equal to this, okay? And then take note of the domain. Find h inverse and state the domain of h inverse. So RG, sorry, I'm reading the question now. So RG is equals to new DG. Yes, you set this RG to be the new domain of G. This case is special because we are looking at G square. So it might be a bit confusing. But yes, you set the range of the inner function to be the new domain of the outer function. So this is the new domain that you set. You are the person controlling this. Does it answer your question? Okay. Moving on, yeah, okay, sorry. Uh, back to part B. Find H inverse and state the domain of H inverse. So we've already done this once, but let's do it together again. What is the, what is H inverse? Okay, so we're going to let Y Sorry, be HX, not H inverse, X. Okay, then what we're going to do, we're going to make X the subject. So we're going to bring it over so that we get yx minus y is x plus 7. We're going to bring all the x terms to one side. So yx minus x is y plus 7. Factorize x out, we get y minus 1 is y plus 7. And what do you see? Can you see that? This is a very special function because the inverse is actually equal to the function itself, right? So you're going to write that h inverse x is equal to x plus 7 over x minus 1. Okay? And state the domain of h inverse. So the domain 
of H inverse is the range of H, right? Okay. So what is it? So you can actually go and plot out on your GC to go and take a look at the range, okay? But I will tell you that the range, okay, is actually all real values except for, okay, so this backslash represents except for negative one. And how do we know that? Because if you look at this graph, right, okay, it clearly has an asymptote of x equals to, or rather if you look at this graph, yeah, of x equals to one actually. No, okay, but you need to go and um, draw the, it has a, it will have a horizontal asymptote of x equals to negative one. Yeah, correct. So if you draw this graph, you will have the asymptote and that's why you won't be able to take um, values of negative one. So again, this backslash, right? I'm going to write for you. This backslash means excluding. Okay, negative one. Yes, the asymptote is x equals to one, um, but the y asymptote will be y equals to negative one. Yeah. Okay, moving on. Um, so then you can write here, okay? So after you write this, right? In your final answer, you should write x is real, not including, oh my God. Negative one. There's supposed to be a. There's supposed to be a. Vertical asymptote. So for this, the asymptotes, right? Will be x equals to. Sorry, I'm answering a question. One. Oh, that is strange. Is it when you draw the graph? When you draw, when you draw the graph, it will be, it will be, both asymptotes x equals to one. Okay, then it's supposed to be one. Sorry, the answer is wrong. Yeah, it's definitely supposed to be one then. Okay, part two, part, part B, part two. Find the exact values of C such that H 20, 2018, right, C is equal to H inverse C and explain your answers clearly. Okay, so let's take a look, right? And what this means. Okay. H 2018, 2018 um, C is equal to H inverse C. This is what the question gives us, right? The clue that the question gives us. Okay. We are going to look, we are going to change both of these, right, into composite functions, okay? So if this, right, H2018C is equal to H inverse C, it means that H, H2018C will be equal to H, H inverse C. Since they are the same one, right? They are equal, right? It means that it will be equal in this way as well. Okay. So sorry, let me mute. Yeah. 
Okay, so what does this mean, right? If we have H, H 2018, okay, it actually means that what we are doing is H many, many, many times until you get H, H in plus C. Yeah, over here. Okay, so why do we add a H on both sides? Because we want to evaluate this way. When we add a H on both sides, it means that we make both sides, right? Like composite functions. Okay, why? Because we want to use uh, a few things to help us solve this question. Okay, the first thing we want to use is this, this fact that F, F inverse, right, is equal to X. Okay, and then we also want to use the composite function to help us solve this question. Right, okay. But also, right, why are we able to do this? Because we know that hx is equal to h inverse x. Can you see? hx is equal to h inverse x, which is also why, right, h, h 2018, even though, right, it is not, there's no inverse over here, you can say that this pattern exists, h, h inverse, h, h inverse, because h is equal to h inverse. Does that make sense? Like, does that answer your question? Okay, so if you go and, or rather if we go and count, right, or rather if you think about it, yes, you can only, okay, you can only do it this way, right, you can only change H, right, you add an extra H here, which actually means that what, okay, so I'm going to explain it this way, yeah? which actually means that over here, we have H, right, 2019 times, can you see? Because there is H, one time of H here, and 2018 times of H here. So altogether, there will be 2019 H over here. You can only represent it this way when H is equal to H inverse. Yes. Okay. So with that, we can conclude that over here, there are 2019 times of this H, H inverse, H, H inverse, right? It keeps going on. Okay. So again, I'm going to write here. We can do this, okay, because H is equal to H inverse. Okay. So this goes on for 2019 times, right? And this will be equal to Okay, so like I said just now, remember, what we're going to use is F, F inverse X is equal to X. That means that what? H, H inverse C is equal to C. Right? So can you see that this happens, right? Okay. Only for even numbers. Okay, I hope you follow. It only happens for even numbers, right? You see, you have to have both H and H inverse for it to be equal to C. Over here, 2019, it is not an even number. Okay, to somebody's question on the chat, what if they are not equal? If they are not equal, you cannot do this. Okay? To be honest, if they are not equal, there won't be this question also. <laughs> yeah. Okay? So like I was saying, because this is uneven, this is an odd number, it means that we will actually end with what? We will end with H, and then we have C over here. Over here, there's 20, 19 times, okay? So that means all this will cancel out, right? Cancel out, cancel out, cancel out, right? Okay, what you'll be left with, right, is actually HC is equal to C. Okay, 
So now you're going to equate. You know that hx is x plus 7 over x minus 1. Wait now. Sorry, can you repeat the second line? This line. Okay. Okay. Let's start again. Okay. So this is what the question gives us. Okay. In order to solve this question, right, I'm going to make use of the fact that ff inverse x is equal to x, which is why I add h to both sides, okay? Since this is equal, right, if I add h to both sides, if I make both a composite function, they should be equal, okay? Add h to both sides, right, then this h inverse c will be equal to c later on. But how do we evaluate this part? If it's h, H20, like 18, this is actually 2019 times of H, right? And since we know the fact that HX is equal to H inverse X, okay, what we're going to do is we're going to alternate it like this, H, H inverse, H, H inverse. So, right, actually, right, this H2019, right, can also be written as H, 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 2019 times. It can also be written like that. But we are making use of the fact that H is equal to H inverse for us to alternate this way so that we can cancel this out, right? Okay? Okay, because they will be equal to... I guess they, they will start to cancel each other out, okay? And then at the end, all you'll be left with is HC. So HC will be equal to C. And from here, how do you solve the question, okay? Because what they want is for you to find the exact values of C. What is HC? You go back to the front part. HX is X plus 7 over X minus 1. Therefore, HC will be C plus 7 over C minus 1 equals to C. And then you're going to solve this. Okay, so you're going to multiply over. So you get C plus 7 is C squared minus C c squared minus 2c minus 7 is 0. c is equal to 2 plus minus root 2 squared to 4, or rather minus 2 squared 4, so minus and 4, ac, okay, a is 1, divided by 2. You can use your gc to solve this as well, okay? So c will be equal to 1 plus minus 2 root 2. Again, I say uh, you can use your GC to solve this as well. Yeah, but your GC will give you a non-exact value, It'll probably give you a decimal. And this question is asking for exact value. So you, at the end of the day, you will still have to do this way. Okay. So it's already nine o'clock, um, but I want to go through the last Two examples, as in part C, right? Okay, so if you will bear with me. Uh, yeah, okay. So the function f is defined by fx is equal to this, okay? Give a reason why f inverse does not exist. Okay. So this is clearly what a quadratic equation, right? We're going to evaluate this. This is clearly a quadratic. Okay, we're going to complete the square. So to complete the square, we need to factorize out 2. Then we complete the square. Okay, I won't go through how to complete the square because you should know how to complete the square at this level. Okay. And then we are going to draw the graph. Okay, so if you draw this graph, it will be a quadratic. We're going to sketch the graph. Okay, it will cut at okay. I don't know what's going on in the Okay, but yeah, okay, sorry, let me continue, okay. 
my drawing is very ugly, but it looks something like that, okay? So this, right, okay, you equate this into zero, okay, then you'll get this is the x value of the minimum point, okay? Yeah, basically it'll be like that, and this will be five, okay? Then as you can see, of course, you go and draw, a horizontal line, okay, it cuts at what? More than one point, right? So then you say since horizontal line y equals to k. So this time you cannot say k is real because you have to say k, right? Okay, is from this point because when it is this point, when it is at this point, it actually cuts at one point. Okay, you cannot just say k is real. So you'll say k is real, but k is more than five negative lambda square over eight. Okay, cuts the graph of f at more than one point. Okay, F is not one to one. Okay, and therefore F inverse does not exist. Okay, now we're gonna look at part two. For the function defined above, the range of f is negative three to infinity. Um, if the domain of f is restricted to all to the set of all positive real numbers, f inverse exists. Find the value of lambda. Okay. So let's take a look from here first, right? They tell me that the range, okay. The range is negative three to infinity, okay? So what is the range of this graph? It is from five, negative lambda square over eight, right, to infinity, right? So the range of F is from five uh, minus lambda square over eight to infinity. And this is actually equal to negative three to infinity. So I'm just gonna equate it. Five minus lambda square over eight is negative three. Lambda square is equal to eight square. Lambda is plus minus eight, okay? Then you say, okay, so you see the clue in the question. Is it plus eight or minus eight? If the domain is, restrict, is restricted to the set of all positive real numbers, then F in reverse that exists. So we're gonna look here again. The domain is restricted to the set of all positive real numbers. You suck into here, right? Okay. If you suck in, Lambda is equal to negative eight. What do you get? You get negative two. If you sub in, lambda equals to eight. Okay, you get two, right? So they say that if the domain is restricted to the set of all positive real numbers it exist, therefore, your lambda should be what? Eight, right? Because the domain needs to be positive. Okay? Is the y-intercept Five plus lambda. No, the y-intercept is five. This minimum value 
is 5 minus lambda square over 8. Does it answer your question? <laughs> mm. Yeah, when x equals to zero, so you're gonna sub it into here. When x equals to zero, right? Can you see that fx equals to five? Because this will be zero, this will be zero, so it'll be five. So your y intercept is five. Does it answer your question? Okay. Yeah. If not, that's it everyone uh, for the practice example. So just because there's probably a lot of J2s here, um, I think some tips, right, for A-levels, um, for math, okay, Please go and understand rather than die die try to memorize the equations. Okay. Um, understand the equations and how to apply them. Practice really makes perfect for A levels, like be it math, chem, whatever, right? Draw your questions, pass prelims, TYS, memorize. You sort of start to memorize through practice instead of like hard memorizing, right? And these equations will start to come to you as like second nature. Okay. Um, and I think very important, please go and time yourself when you are doing the papers, when you're practicing the papers, because most students actually struggle with time management in the exam rather than anything else. Yeah. Okay. So, um, yeah, I have private lessons. Um, yeah, so feel free to contact me if you need um, H2 math tuition. Um, I actually have an open group tuition. I have two spots left for my Saturday class. That happens at 9:30 a.m. Um, every Saturday, but open to opening new classes as well. Uh, minimum will need at least three students to open a class. So you can see the rates over there. And Overmark um actually organizes crash courses for students. Okay. Um, and all students who attend will receive a copy of our curated notes. Yeah. So we are we will be holding a crash courses at two three. Su Chi Humanistic Youth Center, which is a short walk from Yishun MRT. Yeah. Okay. So in the H2 math crash course, um, the first module, right? Okay. Yeah, this has changed a bit from on the website. Um, the first module will be covering functions all the way to vectors of so functions, graphing techniques. Equation inequality, APGP, summation of series, and vectors one, two, and three, which are very big topics. Module two, we will be covering um complex numbers. Okay, then all the remaining pure math topics, basically. Sorry, this is a Saturday. Saturday, not a Thursday. <laughs> and then the last module will be covering statistics. Yeah. Take out correlation and regression because uh, you guys are not tested this year. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, so we're also, we will also start selling the curated notes soon. So do look out for that on our social media platform. That is all. Um, yeah, so feel free to stay back, ask any questions. Um, I'm happy to answer anything. Um, yeah. But thank you. Um, thank you, everyone. Uh, hello, can I refer to question C, part three, like the solution? Thank you. Okay, this part two though, there's no part three. But yeah, this part, yeah. But yeah, thank you everyone. I am so happy that there were so many people that, part that came. Because <laughs> I didn't, honestly did not really know what to expect. Um, but I hope you had fun as well as like learn something, right? Um, the question that I chose is a bit different. Um, and sorry there were like so many hiccups. Honestly, this is my first time like preparing like slides and doing it like on the overmark platform, right? So I was like very nervous as well. Yeah, but thank you everyone for your patience and everything. Thank you so much for thank your you. lesson. Bye-bye. Okay, okay, bye. 
I will stay here until the last person leaves. Yeah, in case anyone has any questions. Hi. Bye bye. Uh, hello. Oh, oh, hi. <laughs> if if the if the lady just now don't need this uh, slide anymore, can I refer to the question which you, is the inverse one, the one which the HH uh, inverse C is equals to? Yeah, yeah, the one that. Okay. Um. So from the second step, right? HH uh two two thousand eighteen C to HH inverse C to the next step. Since you said that H H inverse equals to C, right? So in writing this form with so many H and H in inverse, doesn't it give you like many C's instead of them cancelling it out? Like H H like inverse give you C, right? So there's like C, 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 C. Is understand. It? Yeah, understand your question. Um, no, so actually it will just cancel out, right? Because you see, uh, this is just H, H inverse, right? There's no C at the back. The C is all the way at the back here. So if let's say we have H, H inverse oh. C, H, H inverse C, then yes, it will be C. Oh, okay. But because okay, there okay. isn't, it will cancel out. Oh. Does that answer your question? Yes, but then in that case, right, if it's the H, H inverse C, H, H inverse C, right? How? Oh, sorry, I think you cut off. Would the, like, if it's the H, H inverse C and H, H inverse C, H, H inverse C, right, how would the compounded form look like instead of the H, H 2018 and C? Like, how would it look like in a compounded form? I am like a bit lazy to like go and count, right? So let's say there's like H H inverse C ten times. Okay. okay. So it will be. It will be a power, is it? Like it will be yeah. a power or no? Oh, uh, okay, okay, okay. Yeah, okay. That's the question I have. And this will be um, this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you Yay. so much for the answer. Happy to help. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Any other questions, guys? Or like oh, you yes. to... How do we sign up for the module thing again? The crash course thing. Where do we <laughs> sign up for? Oh, yes. I realized I didn't even say that. Um, yeah, you, yeah, you can go to the, the over, You can go to the Overmark website. So, okay, just to caveat, right? This, like, these topic, um, these topics, right, are not updated on the so basically, okay, in on the website, complex numbers is under module one. But then when I went to reflect, I realized that vectors is like really damn freaking huge. And I will not be able to cover both like vectors and complex numbers here. So I'm moving back to, uh, complex numbers to module two. Actually, right, do you have an opinion? Like, do you think that this, um, I guess, set of topics, like the way that we organize the topics, do you think it's okay? Um, there are like 14 people here, right? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, like, that... If anyone has any strong opinion, like, hey, Joe, you shouldn't teach um, complex numbers in module module um, 2, right? Or something. Like, uh, okay, so personally, I think that module 2 will be a bit texting, like a bit... Heavy? Differentiation and integration itself, right, is actually pretty heavy, given mm -hmm. the number of questions and different types that can possibly come out during the exam yeah there are a lot of que different question types mm -hmm. pertaining to That's differentiation integration correct yeah and differentiation equations although it might be related is actually another kind of working to solving differentiation mm -hmm. equation right uh, if i don't remember it, it's wrongly. true it's true it's true yeah, yeah. Correct. and uh i think that module two is a bit more heavy compared to module one like vectors is very I wouldn't say straightforward, but it is uh, a bit of memorizing of like what they ask, which is projection or like some stuff that you can memorize and do a lot. I don't know, man. I just feel like module two would be a bit too much, personally. Okay, I understand. Yeah. And module okay, so your vote, statistics. Yeah. Maybe, maybe you can consider putting APGP summation down to statistics in module three and then move something up from module two to module one. Okay. Yeah, I said I'll, I'll take I'll take your feedback. Yeah. Um uh, let me yeah. let me go and think <laughs> about know. it also, right? right. Mm, yeah. Okay. I'll update I'll update the the website with like the confirmed modules by the end of the week. So you guys can start like signing up and stuff like next next week, I guess. Yeah. Okay. 
Hi. Yeah. Hello, guy. Hi. Can you go back to the H um, 2018 down? Uh, <laughs> uh, how do you, uh, how do you go from the HH 20, 2018 to the HH inverse, HH inverse, HH inverse, HH inverse? So how do you go from the second to third line, basically? Okay. Um, maybe I explain, right? With another easier example, right? And then you can relate better, right? Because like, 20, 2018 is a really huge number. Yeah. So let's look at like H, H, 5. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay, no, 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 no. Let's look at... Wait, wait, can I... Uh, can I just like uh, give a suggestion? Can can we like just say that you what you do to the because the first that they say that x equals to y. So basically, what you do to the left, you do to the right, you'll be equal. Is that what right. he's asking? Like, yeah, right. Yeah. Okay. No. So okay, I think he understands. Like, okay, correct me if I'm wrong. Ah, uh. um, I think you understand how to get from here to here, right? Uh. Kinda, I guess I like I roughly know what's going on. <laughs> okay, that's not that's not a good answer, dear. Okay, okay, okay. Let, let me explain that. I think um yeah, what you shared. Sorry, what, what is your name? Uh? Um Will. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, okay. Okay. Out. Okay, so yeah, like what Will shared, right? Um you can see it as because this is like x equals to y like that. Okay, or in that sense, this is equal to this. Therefore, whatever you do to this side, you can do to this side and it will be the same. So we are just going to make these two composite functions. Okay. Okay. So that part you understand, right? Yeah. Now, how do we get from here, this 2018, all the way until here? Okay. Let's go down and look at what HH4 represents first. Okay. HH4, X, represents H, H. H, 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 X. Do you agree? Because H square X represents H, H, X, right? Correct. If it's a square here, there's two here. If it's four here, there should be four over here, okay? But because, right, in this case, okay, like I said, H, right, is equal to H inverse, we are going to alternate H and H inverse. It will be H, H inverse, H, H inverse, H, X. And because, right, H, H inverse can eat each other up, right, and that's how I like to look at it, okay? Mm -hmm. This will cancel out, cancel out, and all you're left with at the end is H, X. Oh. And I think something that is important to realize, right, is let's say, okay, we have a different scenario where it's H, H, 3X instead. You realize it will be H, 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 X. And this is equal to H, H inverse, H, H inverse X, right? Okay. Yeah. It will cancel out, cancel out, and all you'll be left with is X. Uh, yeah, does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay, great, awesome. I hope you understand. Like, I truly hope you understand. Yeah, yeah. Thank, thank you so much. Yeah, okay. Uh, will you be doing crash courses during the end of your holidays? The current crash course will be the day after your promos end. Oh my god. So it's not very effective for those in J1. Yes, um, we are thinking of doing more crash courses. Uh, but I will definitely take your feedback and like bring it to the team. Lah, huh? Because um, I think when we push out crash courses, I can't just push out like, hey guys, let's have a math crash course, right? Like it's kind of weird for the brain. Uh, usually we like to push out like all the other subjects as well. So we, I need to see whether like everybody's aligned to, um, yeah, I guess have a crash course in, have a crash course in December. Yeah. Why? There's still someone who wanted to come into the, the chat. That's so funny. Yeah. But I'll definitely take your feedback. Thank you so much for letting me know. Um, yeah. Any other questions? Or, you know, if you guys want to talk about, like, uni and stuff, <laughs> I don't know. Or, like, your JC life, I'm open to talking as well. Oh, hi. You know, hi. this is a question where it's, like, uh, F is equal. I mean, you're supposed to solve for F and F inverse. So, like F e Fx is equal to F inverse X. So, how do you do this kind of question? You're supposed to solve. Okay, sorry, can you give an example? 
are mm. of one. Okay, so for example, like, there are two graphs, right? Which is like the inverse of each other. Okay. Okay, yes, continuous. Yeah. Yes, I'm listening, sorry. Uh, you are supposed to find like X. You're supposed to find X. Yeah. Okay, wait, I got a question. Is F and F inverse the same? Like, are they equal to each other? No, they're not equal to each other. Okay. Then you can just literally, right, go and take whatever that is. So, for instance, like, in this case, okay, this is not a good example because it's, like, equal, right? Um, in this case, you can literally just equate this to be this, and then you solve for X. Uh, okay, because I remember there was one which is, like, uh, you just f x equal to x or something. f x equals x. Yeah. Wait ah. Is it this one? Um. Eh, what is it? Oh, I write it no more. <laughs> yeah, I'm quite confused about that thing. <laughs> That's why I was like, yeah. Is it? Are you talking about this? Yeah. So can I just solve f x equals to x instead of like? Okay, if let's say they ask you to solve f x is equal to f inverse x, this does not equal to x. But if they say f f inverse x like that, then yes, it's equal to x. Does that oh. answer your question? It's different. It's two different things. Okay, yeah, misconception. Thank you. <laughs> You understand or not? Like, you understand the difference? Yeah. So the first, the first square is like you just take the two equation and you equate them together. Correct to solve, and this does not equal to x. Ah, uh, okay. Okay. So this one is different. This is f f inverse x. This is a composite function actually. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Great. Any other questions, guys? Okay, if not, it's already 9.25. Um, I think I will end the lesson. Yeah, have a good night, everyone. Um, and thank you for, you know, like participating and staying up till now. Bye.